The Progressives The period of the 20th century before World War I, when many groups sought to reshape the nation's government and society in response to the pressures of industrialization and urbanization, driven by a general belief that moderate reforms are needed to help end the social disorder. Focus questions. What were the motives of progressive reformers? Two, what sources of thought and activism contributed to the progressive movement? Three, what were the specific goals of progressive reformers and how did they address them? Four, what contributions did President Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft make to progressive movement? How and why did these men come to disagree about the best ways to advance progressive ideals? And five, which policies of President Woodrow Wilson were influenced by the progressive movement? And how did they differ from the policies of Taft and Roosevelt? The Progressive Impulse Reshape American Society The period of the 20th century before World War I, when many groups sought to reshape the nation's government and society in response to the pressures of industrialization and urbanization, driven by a general belief that moderate reforms are needed to help the social disorder. First, regulate capitalism. Progressives of the early 20th century urged the government to play a greater role in regulating capitalism and protecting their citizens. They wanted reform, not revolution. Individual progressives did not always agree on what forms such reforms should take. Who was a progressive? The progressive impulses impacted both political parties and the progressives came from a wide variety of social, religious, political, and economic backgrounds. Middle class reformers addressed many of these problems that contributed to the social upheavals. Journalists and writers exposed the unsafe conditions that factory workers face. In the social sciences, progressives drew on the new social sciences such as sociology, political science, psychology, public health, and economics that were being developed at research universities. Their goals. The progressive movement aimed to return control of the government to the people restore economic opportunities, and correct injustice. The Sources of Progressivism The social unrest at the end of the 19th century bled over into the 20th. Now, business owners were more interested in securing changes to avoid the problems they had experienced beforehand. Known as the Progressive Era, it was marked by the growth in the middle and upper classes. Populism was one of the catalysts of this era, but the economic depression of the mid-1890s, a majority of Americans began to feel that the new measures were needed to promote social progress. The origins of progressivism lay in the crisis of the new urban industrial order as America began questioning the responsibilities of government and themselves, or social order and betterment. By 1900, prosperity was returning and easing the threat of social violence. The rise of the Populist Party in the late 19th century helped fuel the progressive movement. Many of the reformers sought by the populace would be adopted by progressives. Honest government. The publications of the Mugwops on the reform of the civil service shifted the focus of society to ways to reform and improve the systems that affected them daily. These gentlemen reformers made honest government an ideal of progressivism it would also lead to urban issues such as crime, unequal access to electricity, and clean water, building a municipal sewers and mass transit system, and garbage collection. The growing influence of socialism promoted progressivism. Reformers increasingly examined socialist criticism of industrial society. Most progressives sought to reform capitalism as well as introduce humanitarian reforms. A small group of progressives promoted a more radical version of progressivism focused on socialism. They are mostly members of the Socialist Party of America, founded by Eugene Debs in 1901, and included many uh, militant farmers as well as German and Jewish immigrants. Most American socialists have advocated the creation of a stronger central government, public ownership of railroads and utilities, and economic change accomplished through political action. Most progressives believe socialist ideals were too drastic. Muckraking Journalism
The main goal of muckrakers was to raise the public awareness of social problems. Photographs and photojournalism of New York's immigrants by Jacob Rees showed in How the Other Half Lives, Theodore Roosevelt would use muckrakers to increase support for his progressive policies and gave them their name when they said they were often indispensable to society, but only if they know how to stop breaking the muck. Samuel S. McClure recruited journalists to investigate and expose political and corporate corruption for his McClure magazine. St. Clair Lewis wrote The Jungle, the novel with the intention of portraying the life of the immigrants in the United States, but readers were more concerned with a large portion of the book pertaining to the corruption of the American meatpacking industry during the early 20th century. And the book is now often interpreted and taught as a journalist exposure of poor health conditions in the industry. Ida Turbell's The History of the Standard Oil Company described the cutthroat methods of eliminating competition. Lincoln Steffen's The Shame of the Cities was a work published in 1904 that sought to expose public corruption in the major cities throughout the United States. The work consisted of articles written for the magazine McClure and one of his collections. His goal was to provide public outcry and thus promote reform. It showed the suffering and hardship of those immigrated to America. It is considered one of the first primary examples of primary of muckraking journalism. The Octopus by Frank Norris described the rising of wheat in California and conflicts between the wheat growers and the railway company. Norris was inspired by the role of the Southern Pacific Railroad <coughs> in events surrounding the Muscle Slow tragedy that depicts the tensions between the corrupt railroad and the ranchers and the Ranchers League. Religious Activism and Social Responsibility By the end of the century, religious groups were taking up the Settlement House Movement. In the Social Gospel Movement, reform-minded ministers launched the Social Gospel Movement that wanted to introduce religious ethics into industrial relations and appeal to churches to meet social obligations, thereby alleviating poverty, slums, and labor exploitation. Through the social gospel, Christians and Jews provided a crucial source of energy for progressive reformers. The social gospel was the belief that religious institutions and individual Christians should help bring the kingdom of God to everyday life. Relying on the teaching of their faith, they worked to promote laws such as establishing a minimum wage and a shorter workday. Now, what did the proponents of social gospel believe in? They emphasized with the plight of the working poor, advocating a wider tolerance of different religious faiths and promoting the role of Christianity in addressing social problems. The social gospel emphasis on social service as a form of religious practice encouraged the establishment of organizations like the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, a YWCA for women and a YWHA for Hebrews, and the Salvation Army. Such organizations offered young men and women a place to stay and exercise, along with access to libraries, classrooms, and kitchens. The idea was that these services could help people from rural communities or foreign countries. The Salvation Army helped feed the poor and provide day nurseries where working mothers could bring their children. Many proponents of the social gospel rejected social Darwinism, condemned racism and nativism, and sought to help the most vulnerable members of society. One principal reformer was Washington Gladden, a Congregationalist minister in Springfield, Massachusetts. He argued that the greatest thing Christianity should emphasize is the teaching to love thy neighbor as thyself. His publications and teachings, especially Working People and Their Employers in 1876, made him a leader of the reform movement. Walter Rauschenbach's Christianity and the Social Crisis in 1907 argued that Christianity as revealed by Jesus included both personal salvation and a commitment to social justice. To combat the slums and tenement houses, workers such as Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr created residential community centers known as settlement houses. These facilities were mainly staffed by middle-class, college-educated women who had few other outlets for meaningful work. 
They work to improve their lives of their dwellers through meeting their practice needs, such as arranging for nurseries, for working women, kindergartens, and neighborhood programs for children. The Woman's Suffrage Movement. San Francisco suffragists calling for a constitutional amendment marched across the country in 1915 to deliver a petition with more than 500,000 signatures to Congress in Washington, D.C. Along the way, they were warmly received by other suffragists, like those of the New Jersey pictured here. The National American Woman Suffrage Association, NASA, with the rise of the Industrial Realization, women soon became more common in the workplace. By 1910, 7.8 million women worked outside the home. In 1869, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton founded the National Women's Suffrage Association to ensure nationally the right of females to vote. That same year, Julia Ward Howe and Lucy Stone formed the American Women's Suffrage Association that focused solely on suffrage for women. The two groups united to form the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1890. That same year, Wyoming gained statehood and became the first state to grant full suffrage to women. Women in Western states were more likely to become involved in populism. In addition, these less populated states sought to attract women to the region by granting them suffrage. By 1912, women had gained suffrage in 12 Western states. Only in 1917 did New York become the first state east of the Mississippi River to grant all women full suffrage. The women's suffrage movement would not be successful at a national level until the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Progressive Aims and Achievements Political Reforms Direct Primaries and Australian Ballot the selection of party candidates since Andrew Jackson's era have been held at national conventions of party members. During the Progressive Era, this system was supplanted by a direct primary system, in which every party member was allowed to vote for a candidate. When voting, a citizen would ask for a Republican or Democratic ballot. With the Australian ballot, a secret ballot, this would keep pollsters from knowing who a person was voting for, and it took the power out of the hands of the political bosses. The initiative was a bill originated by the people instead of the legislature, and a referendum was a proposed legislative measure that could be submitted to the people for a vote. Recall is where voters could remove a public elected official before the end of his term, but this only applied for state and local offices, not federal. Also during this time, the initiative referendum were introduced and some states were allowed to directly pass laws or force the legislature to consider legislation. In 1913, the 17th Amendment changed the process of electing senators by allowing for direct election by the people rather than relying on votes by the state legislatures. The Efficiency Movement In 1911, the concept of Taylorism was introduced. Frederick Winslow Taylor popularized scientific management to improve efficiency in the workplace, which promoted efficiency to allow workers to accomplish more doing less. Workers became more productive. Henry Ford would introduce the assembly line in 1913. Workers were required to work faster, leading to exhaustion and turnover. Ford would then introduce the $5 a day, eight hour days, and in municipal reform. A Category 4 hurricane slammed into Galveston Bay on the afternoon of September 8, 1900. Winds roared to 135 miles an hour. Its surge rose to a monstrous 20 feet, quickly submerging the city. And from a report by Isaac M. Klein, the senior weather bureau employee in Galveston, the water rose at steady rate from 3 p.m. until about 7.30 p.m when there was a sudden rise about four feet and many seconds. By 8.30 p.m., my resident went down with about 50 persons who sought it for safety, and all but 18 were hurled into eternity. Among the lost was my wife, who never rose above the water. After the wreck of the building, I was nearly drowned and became unconscious, but recovered through being crushed by timbers and found myself clinging to my youngest child. 
This would become the worst natural disaster in United States history. It's estimated between 8,000 to 12,000 people died. The city government botched a relief effort when they tried to do a mass burial at sea, and the bodies came back three days later. They had to resort to burning the bodies, reminiscent of the days of the Black Plague in the Middle Ages. A five-man commission was appointed by the state legislature. Each took charge of a city department. Galveston would become the first major city to adopt the commission system, promoted by efficiency reformers. In this system, a board of commissioners had both legislative and executive powers that are used to lead city departments. Over 60 cities had adopted the commission by 1911. And Staunton, Virginia adopted the even more popular city manager plan in 1908, and many cities followed. In this plan, an appointed city manager ran the city or county government based on the policies that an elected city or county council and mayor adopted. City government in general reforms were aimed to make the government more efficient and try to reduce corruption. A potential unintended consequence of these reform efforts, however, was a decrease in political participation at the local level by many working class voters. Before these changes, the main way many working class voters had participated was through party politics. The reform efforts, on the other hand, often sought to give a large commissioners and nonpartisan specialists more control, thereby making local government less tied to party politics. Wisconsin Progressive Republican Governor Fighting Bob Robert M. La Follette introduced the Wisconsin idea, which promoted nonpartisan reformers to make state government more efficient and reduce corruption at the state level. He led reforms in the nation's first state income tax, workers' compensation, and popular voting in primaries. He led the way in regulating businesses. He taxed railroad property and set up commissions to regulate rates. Efforts under the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 to control big business had proved more symbolic than effective. Attempts to reestablish small firms in the area in which the trust had a monopoly had failed. Social justice, the campaign against <coughs> drinking. Attempts to secure the social justice spread during this time. Some of the forms these efforts took were regulating child labor and the consumption of alcohol, as well as creating more hygienic cities. Promoters of social justice advocated for better working and living conditions and decreased hours for the working poor. They also sought to end child labor and campaign for child care and the ability for children to attend school, arguing that education would make them better citizens. The WTCU. Middle class women became involved in many social justice movements, including the prohibition movement that sought to end the sale and consumption of alcohol. The WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, as it was called, had a membership of 300,000 and demonstrated the popularity of this movement. Some women advocated for temperance or prohibition because they viewed drinking alcohol as a moral sin, whereas many others thought that ending alcohol's grip on people would improve families and domestic violence, reduce public crime, promote social progress, and end the practice of party members buying votes by offering beer on election day. Frances Willard helped expand the objectives of the WCTU during her time as president of the nation's largest women's organization from 1879 to 1898. The group still sought individual temperance and abstinence from alcohol and promoted prohibition. However, they also argued in favor of the eight-hour workday, woman suffrage, child labor regulation, food industry inspections, government-funded kindergartens, and other social forms that they viewed as important for helping working-class families. The Anti-Saloon League, funded in, founded in 1893, focused its efforts on closing saloons and promoting prohibition in local and state elections. In 1913, it endorsed what would become the 18th Amendment, passed by Congress in 1917 and ratified on January 16, 1919. In the 18th Amendment, it became illegal to manufacture, 
transport, and sell intoxicating liquors within an importation. However, it was not illegal to drink. This was due to, it would, it would violate the First Amendment, freedom of religion. For Roman Catholics and Orthodox Christians, they use fermented grape wine in their church services. Labor legislation, working conditions. American consistency led the world in industrial accidents and deaths on the job. Wages were so low that most industrial workers made less than a living wage. Workers were plagued by unsanitary, dangerous working conditions. Many progressives argued in favor of a reduced workday and work week for wage workers. They suggested that workers could do better work if they worked eight hours than the approximately 12 hours they were working, sometimes every day of the week. They also fought for regulation to make working conditions safer for workers and limit child labor. For child labor, most working families depended on the income of their husband, wife, and children in the late 19th century, and around 1.75 million children aged between 10 and 15 worked outside the home in 1900. The number of children under 15 who worked in industrial jobs climbed from 1.5 million in 1890 to 2 million by 1910. Immigrant and immigrant children worked for lower wages. Health problems began to develop, underweight curvature of the spine, respiratory diseases, and more prone to accidents. The National Child Labor Committee documented child labor abuses. Reformers who were focused on ending child labor faced resistance from big business and some poor parents who needed the extra income. Manufacturer conservatives and some poor parents opposed government action on child labor. In 1900, most states had no minimum working age, but by 1914, every state had such law. The Keating Owing Act of 1916 prohibited the transportation of child labor produced goods across state lines. This would be later declared unconstitutional. Public outrage against unsafe working conditions peaked when young female workers died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire in New York City on March 25, 1911. This was the deadliest industrial disaster in the history of the city of New York and resulted in the fourth highest loss of life from an industrial accident in U.S. history. The fire caused the deaths of 146 garment workers who died from the fire, smoke, inhalation, or falling to their deaths. Most of the victims were recent Jewish and Italian immigrant women, aged 16 to 23, the oldest being 48. Because the managers had locked a door to the stairwells and exits, many of the workers who could not escape the burning building jumped from the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors to the streets below. The fire led to legislation requiring it improved factory safety standards and helped spur the growth of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. The Supreme Court's involvement with state labor law sometimes complicated the progressive attempts to promote shorter work weeks and safer working conditions. In Lochner v. New York, 1905, the court ruled unconstitutional New York law that limited bakers to 60-hour work weeks. The argument was that workers had the right to work at any job that they accepted. In Mueller v. Oregon in 1908, however, the court upheld an Oregon law that restricted women to a 10-hour workday or lower. It considered evidence that longer working hours could result in health problems for women. The Progressive Income Tax Progressives asserted that using a graduated or progressive income tax would equalize the distribution of wealth in the nation and help fund the federal government. The income tax level progressed or rose based on a person's income. That is, the rich would pay higher taxes and the poor would pay lower or no taxes, thereby distributing wealth more evenly across the nation. Taxes would also be used for services that would help the poor. In Pollock v. Farmers Loan Trust Company, the Supreme Court rule declared in 5-4 vote that the income tax is a direct tax passed by Congress was unconstitutional. However, according to the justices, only states could levy income taxes. The 16th Amendment. Progressives thus proposed a constitutional amendment 
that would allow the federal government to uh, have a federal income tax. It was ratified as the 16th Amendment in 1913. Progressivism under Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt rejected the limited role of the late 19th century presidents. He sought to broaden executive power by exerting legislative leadership, reorganizing the executive branch, and encouraging the development of a personal presidency. This 1906 cartoon likens Roosevelt to the Greek legend of Hercules, who as a baby strangled snakes sent from hell to kill him. Here the serpents are pro-corporate senators Nelson Aldrich and Standard Oil's John D. Rockefeller. In 1902, Roosevelt embraced a square deal for Americans, which included the three C's, which included greater government control of corporations, enhanced conservation of natural resources, and three, the new regulation to pr protect consumers against contaminated food and medication. Roosevelt was willing to use confrontation and executive power to promote progressive ideas, calling the presidency his bully pulpit, which he shifted the balance of power away from the Congress and toward the executive branch, making a departure from the efforts of the Gilded Age predecessors. Roosevelt sought to uphold existing antitrust legislation as well as add more powerful enforcement powers to it. He often supported the regulations of trust over the dissolution, as he viewed this to be more efficient. In 1904, 318 corporations controlled $7 billion, or 40% of U.S. manufacturing investment capital. Now, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 ineffectively curbed the growth of industry and business mergers into trust. 184 of the 318 were formed after 1898, curbing the trust. The E.C. Knight case of 1894 limited the definition of manufacturing by placing food production beyond the jurisdiction of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Roosevelt saw good trust as having a conscience, while bad trust greedily uses the public. Roosevelt became known as a trust buster because of his attempt to regulate large trusts. The first would come with the North Securities Company in 1902. The antitrust suit against J.P. Morgan's Northern Securities Company led to the company's dissolution. Altogether, Roosevelt administration initiated nearly 25 antitrust suits. Through these cases, the Interstate Commerce Commission created by the Sherman Antitrust Act was further strengthened and made more relevant. If big business victimized workers, TR would see to it that people would be given a square deal. The 1902 Coal Strike John Mitchell led the 140,000 members of the United Mine Workers in Pennsylvania and West Virginia to strike demanding a 20% pay hike, an eight-hour workday, and official recognition of the UMW. Roosevelt did not follow in Rutherford Hayes and Grover Cleveland's footsteps. They immediately sent in troops to restore the mines. Roosevelt attempted to broker a resolution between the two sides. George Bear, a mine owner, refused to meet with the labor leaders. After Roosevelt threatened to send in federal troops to operate the mines, the owners then negotiated through a commission of arbitration and the workers returned to work. In March 1903, they agreed to a 10% pay raise, a nine hour day and tactic recognition of the union. Roosevelt's intervention set a precedent of active government involvement in labor disputes. Roosevelt's re-election. Republicans in Chicago. Theodore Roosevelt campaigned for the presidency in his own right, offering a wide range of policies known as the Square Deal, adding Senator Charles W. Fairbanks of Indiana as his vice president. Democrats, hoping to attract conservative businessmen, nominated John Alton B. Parker for president, although many preferred the liberal Teddy Roosevelt, and Henry G. Davis from West Virginia was nominated for vice president. Socialists nominated Eugene W. Debs and Benjamin Hanford. It was a landslide victory. Roosevelt won 56.4% of the popular vote of 7 million. 
and 336 electoral votes to Parker's 37.6% popular vote and 140 electoral votes. Missouri voted Republican for the first time since the Civil War. In 1905, Eugene Debs founded the Industrial Workers of the World, or the IWW. Roosevelt declared a mandate for the people. He also claimed that he this would be his second term of office. Of legislation. After his election in 1904, Roosevelt pushed through the Hepburn Act, which gave the Interstate Commerce Commission the power to set maximum railroad rates. This led to the discontinuation of free passes to loyal shippers. In addition, the ICC could view the railroad's financial records, a task simplified by standardized bookkeeping systems. For any railroad that resisted the ICC's conditions would remain in effect until the outcome of the legislation said otherwise. By the Hepburn Act, the ICC's authority was extended to cover bridges, terminal ferries, railroad sleeping cars, express companies, and oil pipelines. The Meat Inspection Act to prevent unadulterated or misbranded meat and meat production from being sold as food and to ensure that the, that the meat and meat products were slaughtered and processed under unsanitary conditions. Legend says that Roosevelt was reading Upton Sinclair's The Jungle when he started to throw up from the sausages that he was eating. The Pure Food and Drug Act, children's medicines and had contained opium, cocaine, or alcohol. No longer little Johnny is feeling so well. Colden's liquid beef tonic to help alcoholics contained 26.5% alcohol. So what this act provided was federal inspection of uh, products and forbade the manufacture, sale, and transportation of unadulterated food products and poisonous patent medicines, required that certain special drugs, including alcohol, cocaine, heroin, morphine, and cannabis, be accurately labeled with contents and dosage. The 1906 Act paved the way for the eventual creation of the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Environmental conservation. Regarding how humans should deal with the rural world, Theodore Roosevelt can be best classified as a conservationist. Reckless exploitation of natural resources spawned a conservation movement. Roosevelt made a conservation a cornerstone of his presidency. He tripled the size of federal forest reserves, set aside land for mineral and petroleum, and established dozens of wildlife reserves. Some naturalists favored setting aside permanent wilderness areas. Westerners favored the Bureau of Reclamation that helped shape the modern West. Conservation was the efficient management and the use of the natural resources, such as forests, grasslands, and rivers, as opposed to the preservation or uncontrolled exploitation. Protecting forests, land, and other features of the natural environment from development or destruction, often for the aesthetic appreciation. The Bureau of Reclamation it was a federal agency established in 1902, providing public funds for irrigation projects in arid regions and played a major role in the development of the West by constructing dams, reservoirs, and irrigation systems, especially beginning in the 1930s. Roosevelt would appoint Gifford Pinchot to head the U.S. Forestry Service. Roosevelt and Race Theodore Roosevelt would be the first to appoint an African American to head the Charleston's Custom House. Booker T. Washington would become the first African American to be invited to the White House for dinner. The Brownsville Riot In 1906 in Brownsville, Texas, about a dozen African American regimental soldiers shot several whites who had been harassing them outside the saloon. One white bartender was killed and a police officer was wounded. An investigation concluded the soldiers were at fault, but the shooter could not be identified as none of the soldiers were willing to talk. Roosevelt angrily responded with a dishonorable discharge of the entire regiment of 167 soldiers. His Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, urged Roosevelt to reconsider, but he would not. Sixty years later, the U.S. Army cleared the records of the other black soldiers, some who actually had won the Congressional Medal of Honor during the Spanish and American War.
Taft and retrenchment. William Howard Taft was Roosevelt's handpicked successor. Taft was superiorly qualified to be president of the United States. He became a leading legal scholar serving on the Ohio Supreme Court. In 1900, he was appointed Governor General of the Philippines. Three years later, Roosevelt made him Secretary of War. He supervised the construction of the Panama Canal, an organized relief effort after the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. If presidents, was to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Taft considered politics a nightmare. Where Roosevelt was athletic, Taft was extremely overweight. One instance, he had cabled Secretary of War Elijah Root from the Philippines, stating that he went on a horseback ride and was fine. Root cabled him back and asked, well, how is the horse? Taft was a cautious conservative, progressive, very strict constructionist to the Constitution, limiting the power of the federal government. He believed, unlike Roosevelt, that the president could not take any action that was not specifically specified in the Constitution. Taft would argue the president's authority should only be limited to what is in the Constitution. Taft pursued a more active antitrust program than Roosevelt, breaking up 80 trusts. Roosevelt had supported the Man Elkins Act in 1910. The act had extended the authority of the Interstate Commerce Commission to regulate the telecommunications industry and designated telephone, telegraph, and wireless companies as common carriers. He also supported the 16th Amendment that established the income tax. However, Taft would alienate progressives and become involved in a political morass because of divisions among Republican reformers attempts to restrict the power of the instructionist Speaker of the House, Joseph Cannon. Failure to support the tariff reform legislation and the tariff reduction of 1909, Republican Roosevelt favored a lower tariff, expecting Taft to follow suit. But after much debate, a Republican Congress lowered the tariff only slightly, the Payne-Aldrich tariff that was sponsored by Nelson Aldrich of Rhode Island. Taft signed it with no hint of dissatisfaction, calling it the best bill the Republicans have ever passed. Taft lost support from angry party progressives that were led by Theodore Roosevelt. The Ballinger Pinchot Controversy. Interior Secretary Richard Achilles Ballinger and Chief of Forestry Service Gifford Pinchot. Ballinger's job was to sure the proper legal form of land withdrawals from the private sector as part of Roosevelt's conservation policy. Ballinger reviewed in many instances concluded that the legalities were lacking and the lands had to be returned to the private owners. Pinchot led the objections to these re returns and even convinced an Interior Department subordinate, Louis Glavis, to bring an accusation against Ballinger for fraud and collusion with corporate timber projects. Taft refused to intervene until the resulting discord in the cabinet forced him to act. The president reviewed the matter and then fired Glavis and Pinchot. Ballinger also tendered his resignation, which would have further served to end the matter, but Taft refused for the longest time before accepting it. By then, the political damage had been done and further alienation the progressives for the administration. Recall, it was Pinchot who was appointed by Theodore Roosevelt. The Taft-Roosevelt feud. Although claiming that he was not running for president, Roosevelt went on a 5,000-mile non-political speaking tour covering 16 states outlining a program called New Nationalism. It endorsed a graduated income tax, inheritance taxes, federal regulation of corporate political activities and of labor, especially children and women, and workmen's compensation. For the first time, significant number of delegates to the national conventions were elected in pre presidential preference primaries. Progressive Republicans advocated primary elections as a way to, for breaking control of the political parties by bosses. Altogether, 12 states held Republican primaries. Senator Robert M. La Follette won two of the first four primaries in North Dakota and Wisconsin. But beginning with his runaway victory in Illinois on April 9th, Roosevelt won nine of the last 10 presidential primaries, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Nebraska, 
Oregon, Maryland, California, Ohio, New Jersey, and South Dakota, losing only Massachusetts to Taft. In the Republican convention being held in Chicago from June 18th through the 22nd, Taft, however, had began to gather delegates earlier and the delegates chosen in the primaries were a minority he had support of the bulk of the party organizations in southern states. Roosevelt objected that they were given one quarter of the delegates when they would contribute nothing to Republican victory. Remember, in 1904, Missouri was the first southern state to cross party lines to vote for a Republican. When the convention gathered, Roosevelt challenged the credentials of nearly half the delegates seated that were Taft delegates. And not since the 1872 election had there been a major schism in the Republican Party. Now, with the Democrats holding about 45% of the national vote, any schism could be fatal. On January 22, 1912, Roosevelt asked his supporters to leave the convention, maintaining that Taft had allowed fraudulent seating of delegates to capture the presidential nomination from his progressive forces within the party. Thus, the support of the convention chairman, Root. Taft supporters outvoted Roosevelt's men, and the convention renominated the incumbent ticket of Taft and James S. Sherman. Sherman became the first city vice president to be renominated for re-election since John C. Calhoun in 1828. The Progressive Party Republican progressives reconvened in Chicago and endorsed the formation of a national progressive party. When formally launched later that summer, the new Progressive Party chose Roosevelt as its presidential nominee and Governor Hiram Johnson of California as his vice presidential running mate. Questioned by reporters, Roosevelt said that he felt as strong as a bull moose, henceforth known as the Bull Moose Party. The progressives promised to increase federal regulation and protect the welfare of ordinary people and in a famous acceptance speech, Roosevelt compared the coming presidential campaign to the Battle of Armageddon and stated that the progressives were going to battle for the Lord. However, many of the nation's newspaper, which tended to be pro-Republican, harshly depicted Roosevelt as an egotist who was only running for president to spoil Taft's chances to be, feed his vanity. Woodrow Wilson, a progressive Southerner. Woodrow Wilson was born in Stockholm, Virginia in 1856, and he'd grown up in Georgia and the Carolinas during the Civil War and Reconstruction. He had a deep religious faith and was convinced that God selected him to serve humanity. Wilson had graduated from Princeton University in 1879 and also from law school at the University of Virginia. He earned a doctoral degree at John Hopkins University and became president of Princeton in 1902. Wilson became governor of New York and was intentionally ambitious and idealistic. As governor, he adopted uh, progressive reforms to curb the power of the party bosses and corporate lobbyists. At the Democratic convention that was held in Baltimore, Maryland from June 25th to July 2nd, it proved to be one of the more memorable presidential conventions of the 20th century. Initially, the front runner appeared to be House Speaker Champ Clark of Missouri, and Clark did not receive the largest number of delegate votes early in the balloting. However, he was unable to get the two-third majority required to win the nomination. Clark's chances were hurt when Tammany Hall, the powerful, corrupt Democratic political machine in New York City, threw its support behind him, causing William Jennings Bryan, the former three-time Democratic presidential candidate, and leader of the party's progressives to turn against Clark as the candidate of Wall Street. Bryan shifted his support to New Jersey Governor Woodrow Wilson, who had consistently finished second to Clark on each ballot, was regarded as a moderate reformer. Wilson had nearly had given up hope and was on the verge of having a concession speech read for him at the convention that would free his delegates to vote for someone else. Instead, Bryan's deflection from Clark to Wilson led many of the other delegates to do the same, and Wilson gradually gained strength while Clark's support dwindled. Wilson finally received the nomination on the 46th ballot. 
Tom Marshall, the governor of Indiana, who had swung the Indiana delegates' votes to Wilson in later ballots, was named as his running mate. The Election of 1912 The Socialist Party candidate Eugene Debs called for the end of capitalism and crisscrossed the country giving fiery speeches and claiming that Roosevelt was a charlatan. Democrat Woodrow Wilson argued that the dollar diplomacy was a form of economic imperialism, attack on tap. Wilson's new freedom rejected what he called Theodore Roosevelt's regulated monopoly. Under new freedom, Woodrow Wilson's 1912 program called for a limited government intervention in the economy to restore competition by curtailing the restrictive influences of trust, government breaking up monopolies and removing protective tariffs, thereby providing opportunity for individual achievement. Wilson also opposed social welfare legislation. Taft essentially gave up and stopped campaigning, leaving, believing that no one really liked him. Taft had called TR an egotist. In response, Roosevelt called Taft a fathead with a brain of a guinea pig. While Roosevelt was campaigning in Milwaukee on October night. 14, 1912, a saloon keeper from New York, John Flaming Shrank, shot him, but the bullet lodged in his chest only after penetrating both his steel eyeglass case and the 50-page single-folded copy of his speech titled, Progressive Cause Greater Than Any Individual. He was to deliver carried in his jack pocket. Shrank was immediately disarmed and captured and might have been lynched had Roosevelt not shouted for Shrank to remain unharmed. Roosevelt assured the crowd that he was all right, then ordered police to take charge of Shrank and make sure that no violence was done to him. Roosevelt was an experienced hunter in Adamus and correctly concluded that he was not coughing blood, the bullet had not reached his lung, and he declined suggestions to go to the hospital. Instead, he delivered his scheduled speech with blood seeping into his shirt. He spoke for 90 minutes before completing his speech and accepting medical attention. His opening comments to the gathered crowd were, Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you fully understand that I have been just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Results the split within the Republican Party enabled Woodrow Wilson to carry most states and become president, even though he won only a minority of the popular vote. If Taft or Roosevelt had not split the vote, either one of them would have easily defeated Woodrow Wilson. Progressivism was the big victor, since all four candidates ran on a progressive platform. Roosevelt's Progressive Party finishing second would be the best finish for a third party in the history of the United States. A burst of reform bills. Wilson proposed a full legislative program. He had strong convictions and believed that God was directing his actions. Despite their differences, Wilson and Roosevelt shared a belief that national problems demanded national solution. Wilson would be the first to speak to the nation over radio and host weekly press conferences as president. In his first two years, he pushed through Congress more new bills than any previous president. His victory coupled with the majorities in the House and the Senate gave Democrats effective national power for the first time since the Civil War. Colonel House was his closest advisor from Texas and was the most skilled politi political operators in the history working behind the scenes to excite and mobilize others. House would steer Wilson through proposals in Congress in which Southerners by virtue of their seniority held the lion's share of committee chairmanships. The Underwood Simmons Tariff Act of 1913 was the first substantial reduction in duties since the Civil War. Using the income tax to replace potentially lost revenues, the Democrats passed the largest tariff reduction since the Civil War, reducing 958 items, an average of 30 percent, and cotton and woolens by 50 percent. The Revenue Act of 1914 was the first tax on incomes, over $3,000. The rate was 1% for incomes over 3,000. Most Americans made less than $3,000 a year. The Southern percent, the highest, was for incomes over 500,000. Democrats sold the idea of taxing the rich only. Before the decade would end, the rate would increase to 75%.
the Federal Reserve Act. Woodrow Wilson sought to reform banking primarily through the Federal Reserve Act. The Owen Glass Federal Reserve Act of 1913 created 12 regional bank districts with a central headquarters or Federal Reserve Bank in each district. It required all national banks to join the system, depositing one half to two thirds of their revenues into a common account. The Federal Reserve Banks could be used for as a depository for government funds and only dealt with banks, not private individuals. It provided a bank cur note currency ending notes by private banks, created a Federal Reserve Board coordinated by the Treasurer and including the Com Comptroller of Commerce, and six financial experts supported by the President. Antitrust Action The Clayton Antitrust Act strengthened the Sherman Antitrust Act by exempting labor unions and farm organizations from antitrust laws, such combinations being not in the restraint of trade. It restricted the use of court injunctions against unions and legalized the use of strikes, peaceful picketing, and boycotts while outlawing interlocking directors and tying agreements, retailers forbidden from handling a competitor's product. Samuel Goffers declared this the Magna Carta of labor. The Free Trade Commission, the FTC, was a government agency established in 1914 to provide regulatory oversight of business activities. The FTC quickly became friendly to businesses. Wilson declares victory. In November 1914, just two years after his election, Wilson announced he accomplished his major goals and that his new freedom was now complete. His victory, a declaration, bewildered many progressives, especially those who had long advocated additional social justice legislation that the president had early supported. Only African Americans just seemed to be left out of a lot of the progressive reforms. Carter Glass of Virginia, largely responsible for developing the Federal Reserve Act, was enthusiastic about disenfranchising black voters. Wilson shared many of the racist attitudes common at the times. Jofus Daniels, the Secretary of Navy, was a white supremacist. Daniels and the other cabinet members segregated the federal employees from their offices, dining halls, and restrooms. Wilson saw racial segregation as a benefit. Not one African-American leader would support Wilson in the 1916 presidential election. Vote for women. Wilson would not support a constitutional amendment to give women the right to vote. He believed that that was up to each state. Women would press the right to vote by winning some local battles. Carrie Chapman Catt succeeded Susan B. Anthony as president of the NAWSA. Alice Paul was a graduate and had a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania. She broke away from NASAW and formed the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage and the Suffragist Magazine. She organized a march in which 5,000 women suffragists uh, to protest Wilson's inauguration in 1913. The protesters, although well-behaved, were spat upon and roughed up while police did nothing. After the inaugural, Paul and three others met Wilson in the White House and warned if he continued to oppose the amendment that they would rally against him at the next presidential election. Wilson kicked him out of the White House. On January 11, 1917, in a driving rain and sleet, Paul and her followers picketed the White House with the statement, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? For the next six months, the women continued to picket the White House. Wilson finally ordered their arrest and they were placed on trial. Paul was sentenced to seven months in prison. Buffeted by negative press conference and public criticism, Wilson would pardon Paul and the other activists. Finally, in 1920, women finally would win the right to vote, mostly through the help of the Republican Congress with the 19th Amendment.
Women's suffrage in the United States before the ratification of the 19th Amendment, beginning with Wyoming in 1869, women's suffrage slowly gained acceptance in the West, but women in the South and much of the East got the ballot only when the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. It was the state of Tennessee that finally ratified the 19th Amendment. Progressivism renewed. As the 1916 election approached and the Republicans had settled their differences, Wilson supported more reform measures. Wilson appointed Louis Brandis of the, to the Supreme Court. Conservatives opposed Wilson's nomination of Louis Brandis to the Supreme Court because Brandis was Jewish and had issued pro-labor opinions. The Federal Farm Act of July of 1916 made credit available to farmers as low interest rates for improvements and established a land bank system. The Smith-Lever Act of 1914 provided programs that educated farmers about their new machinery and new ideas regulated to agriculture efficiency. The Smith-Hughes Act of 1917 funded agricultural and mechanical education in high schools. The Addison Act abolished the eight-hour workday for railroad workers and the kern McGinley Act set up a workers' compensation system for federal employees. And finally, the Keaton Owen Act prohibited interstate shipment of goods made by child labor. However, two years later, the U.S. Supreme Court would rule in Hammer v. Dagenhart, declaring it unconstitutional, claiming only the states had the right to regulate working hours. Assessing Progressivism Progressivism reached its peak during Woodrow Wilson's two terms as president and the notion that a nation's quality of life can be improved by government action. The laissez-faire notion that government had no role had been eliminated. Progressives established the principle that government, local, state, and federal had a responsibility to ensure Americans were protected from the abuse of power from businesses and corrupt politicians. Ultimately, progressivism faded as the organized political movement opticism disappeared in the wake of the Great War in Europe.